This conference will now be recorded. Today our topic of discussion would be regarding the TB hip. So TB hip is the osteoarticular joint affected by tuberculosis. It's the second most common after spinal tuberculosis. Usually TB spine is most common in a musculoskeletal system, but TB hip constitutes the second most common after spinal tuberculosis. So we will discuss today regarding the pathogenesis, the sites of affection of the TB in hip, its clinical features and its diagnosis and its management. Tuberculosis of hip joint is ranked next to spinal tuberculosis and it constitutes 15% of all osteoarticular tuberculosis. Initial focus of infection will be either in the establer roof, epiphysis, metaphyseal region, greater trochanter, synovial membrane, and trochanteric person. So if you see this diagram here, you can see the focus of infection, the septic focus of infection of tuberculosis will be in the establer roof A or in the synovial membrane, the B in the chart, or in the epiphysis C in the diagram or in the greater trochanter, E in the diagram, and neck of the femur, or metaphyseal region, D in the picture shown on the right side. So commonly, the initial focus of infection will be either in the establer roof, epiphysis, metaphyseal region, greater trochanter, synovial membrane, which is a rare phenomena, and the trochanteric person. So bony focus of infection is more common rather than soft tissue focus of infection like synovial membrane in TB hip. Coming to the pathogenesis, the primary focus of tuberculous bacilli will be at the lung, tonsil or gastrointestinal tract and it spreads through the hematogenous root, blood root and synovial veins membrane is the one most commonly affected and tuberculous formation causes synovial hypertrophy resulting in panus formation. So once the focus of infection is there in the synovial membrane, chronic inflammatory response will happen that will lead to hypertrophy of the synovium because of chronic inflammatory response and it results into hypertrophy of the synovial membrane and pathologically it is described as panus formation. And this panus destroys the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage of the hip joint involving the cartilaginous surface of the femoral head and cartilaginous surface of the acetabulum are being destroyed by the proliferation of this panus because of the mediators released of chronic inflammation and it leads to the destruction of the articular cartilage. The articular surface of both the acetabulum and the femoral head are being destroyed by this panus which is a chronic inflammatory response. So once the cartilage has been destroyed, the underlying subchondral bone of the femoral head and the establum is being exposed. So once the bone has been exposed, there will be fusion or fibrous ankylosis initially, but bony ankylosis is very uncommon in tuberculosis because the destruction in tuberculosis is mostly a chronic process it is not like an acute process like in septic arthritis it takes months to years so that the destruction of the cartilage in tuberculous hip will be like a patchy that is not like patches that means there will be intermittent normal cartilage and destroyed cartilage on both the surfaces articulating surface of both the femoral head and the stabbing so a patchy destruction of this cartilage will result in fibrous ankylosing rather than bony ankylosis because some of the cartilage is intact, some of the cartilage is destroyed. So, and it's a chronic, slow, insidious process. So fibrous ankylosis is common in tuberculosis of hip rather than bony ankylosis where the destruction of the cartilage is fast in bony ankylosis as well as whole of the cartilage is lost 
to result in fusion of both the subcondyl exposed bones. But whereas in tuberculosis, the destruction of the cartilage is patchy. That means there will be intermittent normal cartilage as well as islands of destroyed cartilage. And it's a slow chronic process. So fibrous ankylosis is the commonest sequelae of TB heap, where, whereas in septic it is bony ankylosis, where the destruction of the cartilage is throughout, whereas in TB heap the destruction of cartilage is patchy. That's why it is fibrous ankylosis. So that is regarding the pathogenesis of the TB heap. And coming to next, microscopy of this tuberculous or this chronic tuberculous inflammation results in tuberculous formation. It consists of Jain cells, lymphocytes, and upper end of the femur is intracapsular and the joint gets rapidly involved. The joint involvement in establer lesions is rare. The small tuberculous collar coiles undergo caseation and form a cold abscess. And the cold abscess tracks along the areas of least resistance. This is all the microscopic picture and the pathogen says the, since it's a chronic inflammatory response, there will be formation of lymphocytes, Jain cells, and joint involvement with TB is very rare when the septic focus is in the, when the tuberculous focus is in the establum side. But if the femur is involved, upper end of the femur involved, then the joint destruction is very rapid. And cold abscess is very common. Why they term the term cold abscess in tuberculosis? Because the inflammatory phenomenon is chronic and insidious process. There is no acute changes like in septic abscess. So it will be a cold abscess which tracks along the area of least resistance. So we will see what are the areas where this cold abscess will track. The sides of the cold abscess would be femoral triangle and it will be in the inguinal region. The medial side of the thigh, greater trochanter, gluteal region, ischiorectal fossa, lateral and posterior aspect of the thigh, and the pelvis. So most commonly, the usually the abscess will track along the line of least resistance. So the tuberculous cold abscess in the hip will track, and it be and it will be lying in the region of the femoral triangle. It usually trickles down along the neurovascular structures. So it will be commonly the cold abscess sites in TB hip would be mostly the femoral triangle, inguinal region, medial side of the thigh, later trochanter, gluteal region, ischiorectal fossa, later and posterior aspect of the thigh and pelvis. And what are the clinical features? If there is a tuberculous hip, how the clinical presentation of the patient in the clinic in the wards will be? It will be in the open. Commonly, it will be in the First three decades of life, after 30 years, it's commonly, usually you can see the tuberculous hip involvement. And common clinical feature would be the patient will be coming to the OPD with a limp, that is painful limp of the hip. And the limp is the most commonest, earliest symptom. So he'll be limping. And the limp is always, always painful. And there will be antalgic gait. Antalgic gait in the sense in the stance phase, it will be very short. That means the patient will be unable to wait bare for a long time on the affected hip. So there will be a short stance phase and it will result in antalgic gait. That means that the patient will try to avoid long time in stance phase. So he will try to jump off away from the stance phase. So there will be an antalgic gait. He will try to avoid long period of weight bearing. So he will try to push off a short stance phase which result in antalgic gait. And pain is maximum towards the end of the day, and there will be history of night cries. What does this night cries mean? That is, during night time when the patient falls asleep, the muscles surrounding the hip joint will be relaxed. So there will be spasm will be gone. So once the spasm is relieved in the night times when you are sleeping, the the destroyed ends of the upper end of the femur and the establum they come near towards the joint space collapses and when the subchondral bone, the nerve fibers, the exposed nerve ends of the subchondral bones, when they grate against each other, then the patient will suddenly wince in pain. So how to describe the classic night cries in the tuberculous hip? This is the classic symptom and the clinical features that you commonly see in the TB hip. So night cries, how to describe it? Usually, in the history of night cries, the initially the patient will be going to sleep without any history of pain. But once he falls asleep, there will be a normal 
duration of sleep pattern but in the middle of the night because once the muscles have been relaxed the eroded bone ends are the subchondral bone of the femur and the stabulum where the exposed nerve endings they grate against each other and suddenly the patient will wake from the sleep with a pain so this is the classic description of night cries the patient he, he gives the complaint like he has a normal initial period of sleep but in the middle of the night he is waking up from the pain in the hip the most classic feature of night cries and it's a classic clinical feature and usually you see in the fever things so you should arrive at a proper diagnosis based on the history that is you should think of tuberculous bacilli affecting the hip joint so history of night cries is a classic clinical feature in tbd and there will be marked wasting of the thigh and gluteal muscles because the patient will be very cachexic and if you see there will be wasting of the thigh and gluteal muscles because it's a chronic inflammatory response and there will be presence of scars and sinuses because it will be having cold abscess so once the cold abscess forms there will be tracks sinuses and they heal and they'll cause a scars so scars sinuses mark wasting of the thigh and the gluteal muscles and there will be a presence of cold abscess i have already discussed femoral triangle the sites of the cold abscess the femoral triangle you should check the inguinal region you should check the femoral triangle scarpus triangle greater trochanteric region medial side of the thigh gluteus region all those you have to feel for any swelling and these swellings are usually they are collection of pockets of pus or cold abscess of the tuberculosis but this abscess doesn't have warmth or tenderness same like as you see in the septic sequelae these are cold they don't have any inflammatory symptoms like rubber dolor paler all those so that's why it is called as the cold abscess because the acute inflammatory response is not seen in tuberculosis it's a chronic insidious process and there will be destruction of the upper end of the femur and the establum and there can be 10% of the cases may show pathological subplex uh, sublimation and tenderness can be elicited by direct pressure in the femoral triangle and in the in the exam physical findings by trochanteric compression test is positive how to elicit the by trochanteric compression test making the patient to lie supine and with your palm of your hand you have to put a thrust on either side of the trochanter on both sides of the pelvis medially simultaneously when you try to compress the pelvis by the pressure over the greater trochanter on either side of the pelvis then there will be patient will have tenderness over the femoral triangle region that is classic for tuberculosis hip and the attitude is also very important in examining the stage of the tb hip which i will discuss in detail in the next few slides and what are the deformities the attitude or the deformities in the physical examination what are the different attitudes that will happen in the initial stages of the disease the patient keeps the hip in flexion why the patient keeps the hip in flexion in the initial stages of the disease because this is the position of ease and maximum joint capacity so the joint will be have fully expanded in by when you flex the hip so that it can accommodate all the fluid all the abscesses all the debris from the tb hip and the patient feels ease so this is the position of the ease that's why the hip will mostly be in in flexion once there is a flexion person keeps the hip in the flexion there will be soft tissue contractures convert this into a flexion deformity making locomotion or the movement of the pose impossible and in an effort to bring the limb on the ground and to make locomotion possible the lumbar spine undergoes exaggerated lordosis and thus conceals the fixed flexion deformity so if you see this diagram you exam if you see this diagram the patients will be there will be a flexion of the hip so there will be flexion of the hip and there will be contraction of the flexors of the hip and once a flex hip you have to conceal the deformity the patient will bring the limb onto the ground but in an in to compensate for this the lumbar spine undergoes exaggerated lordosis thus when the lumbar spine goes into exaggerated lordosis the flex flexion deformity is been concealed so how to reveal this this is a test called thomas test there is a test called thomas test to describe the flex flexion how to examine for the flex flexion deformity in the tb hip there is a test called as a thomas test how to elicit the thomas test 
you have to make the patient to lie down on the bed in the face of his flex flexion deformity because of exaggerated lordosis. The spine will be exaggeratedly lordotic and there will be, patient will be lying on the bed. And how do you confirm it? You have to confirm by the easy passage of the examiner hands between the bed and the back of the patient. So there will be an arching of the lumbar spine when you make the patient to lie down on supine on a bed with a fixed flexion deformity, there will be back will be exaggerated lordosis of the lumbar spine. You try to insinuate your hand between the bed and the back of the patient. And to reveal the fixed flexion deformity, the Thomas test is carried out. How you will elicit it? The unaffected hip of the patient is flexed over the abdomen until the lumbar lordotic curve disappears. The affected hip is then assumes a position of flexion. And the degree of FFD is calculated by the angle formed between the thigh and the bed. So if you see this diagram here, you ask the normal leg to be flexed by the patient himself. And you insinuate your hand underneath the spine, lumbar spine and the bed until unless this lordosis has been obliterated, till then the normal hip has been flexed. Once that has been done, you see the opposite left hip it has been elevated in the diagram to the number two describes the angle of flex flexion deformity. So this is the angle that is formed between the thigh and the couch of the bed. So to repeat it again, there will be exaggerated lumbar lordosis in flex flexion deformity. So to reveal the flex flexion deformity, you have to obliterate the exaggerated lumbar lordosis. Then only the flex flexion deformity of the hip will be revealed. How to obliterate the lumbar lordosis? You insinuate your hand, back of your hand, between the bed and the back of the patient, and you try to flex the opposite hip. When you try it, till what angle you have to flex the opposite normal hip, till the lumbar lordosis is been obliterated. Once it has been obliterated, you see the normal left hip, it has been elevated from the couch. So the angle that is found between the thigh and the bed of the couch is the flex flexion deformity of the that respect to hip. So once the lordosis has been obliterated, then the flex flexion deformity is being revealed. And the test that has been clinically done is the Thomas test, which I have been described now. And if you want to see here, there is a video describing the flex flexion deformity. It will give you an idea And if you watch this video, so th there is the examiner and there is an exaggerated lumbar lordosis of the hip. You see here, the examiner pushes his hand and normal hip he is flexing. He is flexing the normal hip. When you flex the normal hip, the lordosis exaggerated is being obliterated. You, you ask the patient to hold the normal hip. The opposite pathological hip, you try to push near the patella. I will play it again. There is an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. You insinuate your hand beneath the exaggerated lumbar lordosis and flex the normal hip. Till when? Till the lordosis is being obliterated. And if you see the opposite right hip, it has been getting flexed. You see the opposite right thigh, it has been flexed. And you try to push the patella down till it is stable. Then you see the angle that is formed by the thigh with the couch that is the flex flexion deformity. So finally, I will play one more time. And this is exaggerated lumbar lordosis. You insinuate your hand between the exaggerated lordosis. You have to obliterate this. So the, the normal hip has been flexed. Till when you will flex the hip? Till the lordosis has been obliterated. You ask the patient to hold the normal hip flexed until the lordosis is obliterated. And if you see the right hip, it has been getting flexed and you try to push the patella down and you see the angle that is formed by the thigh with the couch. That is the flex flexion deformity you have to elicit in the clinical settings. So this is one picture. And coming to the next slide, the other deformity that is commonly seen in the TB hip in the physical examination is the adduction deformity. How do you elicit the adduction deformity? You see the picture number one here, the left hip is being adducted. So 
the erection position adopted by the patient is because due to the spasm of the erector muscles on the medial side of the thigh following damage to the articular cartilage the soft tissue contractures convert to one of the flicks adduction deformity the limb is now brought to the ground by elevation of the pelvis it is evidenced by the anterior superior iliac spine being at a higher level on the affected side and there is scoliosis of the spine away from the deformities so what the author is trying to describe here is the fixed adduction deformity and if you see the picture here in the first picture in the image here you see the left hip is been adducted why this is happening because of the contractures of the medial side of the thigh muscles so the soft tissue contraction will cause the on the medial side of the hip joint will cause the adduction of the deformity fixed adduction deformity how it is clinically been evidenced it is evidenced by the anterior superior iliac sign being higher level on the affected side if you see here the affected side asis will be at a higher level how it will happen because to reveal this go to the next slide it is compensated with it can be revealed by squaring the pelvis what is the squaring of pelvis means you have to try to bring the adducted the iliac anterior superior iliac spine to the same straight line so how you will square the pelvis you have to position the limb in the same level if you if you see this images in the first image the lady left hip is been the left leg is been adducted this is the pathological hip the left side is the pathological hip the leg is been adducted because of the contractures of the medial side muscles so the anterior iliac anterior superior iliac spine is being it is on the higher level how it will happen because you try to abduct the limb and you put a block below it so that the anterior iliac spine will come at a higher level so it is compensated by scoliosis with convexity towards the normal side and the pelvis being tilted up causing apparent shortening of the limb so you see here it's a brick below the affected limb left side this indicates there is shortening of the limb so adduction means the limb will be crossing the midline medially because of the spasm of the medial side erector muscles so to compensate for it that is a patient with an erected limb cannot walk so what he will what the patient will do he will try to abduct the hip so in an in an compensate because a cross leg nobody can walk so if a limb is been erected he will fixed in adduction he can, nobody can walk with a cross limb so the patient will try to abduct the hip so what happens if you try to abduct the hip the anterior superior iliac spine will go to a higher level so that's why the anterior iliac spine superior iliac spine will be at a higher level and there will be shortening you can appreciate it there is a brick below the since the pelvis is tilted up there will be apparent shortening of the affected hip so this is the concept of fixed adduction deformity so initially because of pathology what is the pathology here there is adduction of the affected hip in this image it is the left hip so there is an adduction of the hip means there will be crossing of the limb towards the midline or medially so a patient cannot walk with an adducted limb so he will try to compensate it by abducting the hip when you try to abduct the hip the same side anterior superior iliac spine will go to an higher level and you can see the apparent shortening the limb appears if you try to lift the pelvis the limb appears short and that you can appreciate in the second image by a brick below the affected hip that is on the left side and to compensate for this coronal deformity there will be scoliosis that is curvature of the spine towards the convex tree, lumbar spine towards the normal side so that is regarding the fixed adduction deformity and next deformity we have discussed regarding the flexion deformity we have discussed regarding the adduction deformity the next deformity would be the abduction deformity so how this abduction deformity if you saw if you see this slide in the initial phase of the disease because of the increase in the joint space due to the effusion the limb assumes a position of flexion abduction and external rotation so this is the position of ease the patient walks with flexion abduction extension if fixed in this position by the soft tissue contracture 
the patient develops a fixed abduction deformity. So if it is fixed in these positions by soft tissue contractures, the patient develops a fixed abduction deformity. So you see the image number one in this lady here. The limb has been in abducted, fixed in abduction. A patient cannot walk with a wide, wide leg, wide position limbs. So he has to bring the abducted hip to the midline. So in the image two, you see the left hip, it is brought to the midline to compensate for it. And what happens? The pelvis on the same side, if you try abducted hip, if you try to bring it to the normal side, the, the ASIs on the same side will dip down. That is, pelvis will dip downwards. So it is evident clinically by the ASIs lowering at a lower level with the corresponding scoliosis of the spine, spine towards the affected hip. So initially, adduction deformity, the spine will be opposite side. The spine will be convex towards the opposite side, whereas in fixed abduction deformity, the spine will be towards the affected side. So if you see here, the deformity can be relieved by abducting the affected hip until both the anterior superior leg spine lie in the same level. And the angle formed between the vertical and the abducted limb is the angle of fixed abduction deformity. So this is how the deformity will be so to summarize in the, in the image a the limb is being abducted fixed in abduction a patient cannot walk with an abducted limb so wide leg she cannot walk so she tried to bring it the limb to the midline in an effect to bring it to the midline the asis of the pelvis will drop down and the spine will also curve to the same side convexity to the same side so this is how the abduction deformity how to reveal it? Just you, you are, it can be abduction deformity can be relieved. How much is the abduction deformity? What is the angle? How to know it? Deformity can be revealed by abducting the affected hip until both the anterior superior iliac spine are at the same level. And the ang angle that is formed from the midline to the affected hip is the angle of fixed abduction deformity. So all these deformities are concealed, but to reveal it, we have to nullify the compensations. Once you nullify the compensation, then only the deformity will be relieved. This is the whole logic between the flexion deformity, adduction deformity, or abduction deformity. How do you nullify the abduction deformity? You have to abduct the limb more. How you nullify the adduction deformity? You have to adduct the limb more. That is, you have to bring the ASIS at the same level. Then only the angle that is formed by the either the abducted or the adducted limb with the midline or the vertical line is the angle of fixed adduction or abduction deformities. So these are the deformities that are being described in the TB hip. Limb length discrepancy. Initial stages there will be apparent lengthening but in advanced stages the patient develops shortening. So initially there will be the limb will be apparently lengthened because of synovitis but because of destruction of the joint there will be shortening how this happens we will describe so just remember this summarization of this slide which shows what are the deformities if the asas that is anterior iliac superior anterior superior iliac spines are at the same level there is no adduction or abduction deformity there is no adduction or abduction deformity and the apparent measurements are equal to the real measurements. Whereas if anterior superior iliac spine has been raised at a higher level, that indicates it is an adduction deformity. If it's the ASIS is at, at a lower level, it indicates abduction deformity. So you should memorize this chart. It should be at any time you should be able to see if the ASIS clinically are at the same level means there is no deformity. But if ASI is its higher level means it indicates adduction deformity, ADD, adduction deformity. If the ASI seems to come to the lower level, it indicates abduction deformity, ABD, abduction deformity. In adduction deformity, the apparent shortening is more than the real shortening, whereas in abduction deformity, the apparent lengthening is more than the real lengthening. So these are all the findings you have to see. Coming to the stages of tuberculosis, there are four stages of tuberculosis. The stage one is called as the stage of synovitis, and stage two is called as the stage of early arthritis, and stage three is called as the stage of late arthritis. 
and stage four is the stage of destruction. These are the four stages we will describe in tuberculous hip. What is the stage one? Stage of synovitis. And stage two is the stage of early arthritis. And stage three is the stage of late arthritis. And stage four is the stage of destruction. So we will describe this in detail. Stage of synovitis. How does it happen? That is initial stage. That is the disease focus is in the synovitis, synovial tissue. So the patient assumes flexion, abduction, and external rotation position of the limb. So it is the this is the position where there will be maximum accommodation of maximum accommodation of the. So, sorry, the stage of synovitis. This is the stage, the disease is synovial. The patient assumes flexion, abduction, and external rotation position of the limb, and there is apparent lengthening. There is apparent lengthening. The limb appears to be lengthened, and there is no real shortening. And there is no real shortening, and the extremes of movements are decreased and painful. Here, apparent length is more than true length. Here, apparent length is more than the true length. So, what is the stage of synovitis? The patient initiates the disease, focus is in the synovial tissue. And the patient assumes flexion, abduction, external rotation position because of the accumulation of the fluid. And there will be apparent lengthening. That means the limb appears to be lengthened. The limb appears to be lengthened. And there is no real shortening because only the synovium has been involved. There is no destruction of the joint. So, because of flexion, attitude of flexion, abduction, external rotation, the limb appears to be lengthened, but there will be no real shortening because the cartilage is still intact. And the extremes of the movements are decreased and painful. And here, the apparent length is more than the true length. That is called stage of synovitis. And the next stage is the stage of early arthritis. What is this? That is destruction of in, in alkali. According to this, Early arthritis, additional to the synovium, there is early stage of destruction of the cartilage. That is femoral and establum side, the cartilage just brought destroyed. So the joint appears to be shortened. So there is a real shortening. So the local signs are exaggerated. The spasm of the adductors and flexors will result in a deformity of flexion, adduction, and internal rotation of the affected hip. So there is apparent shortening and there is significant muscle wasting and Hip movements are decreased in all directions and there will be a true shortening that will be less than one centimeter because the restriction of the cartilage is only in the initial stages. The amount of true shortening will be less than one centimeter. Here, the apparent length is less than the true length. In the stage of synovitis, the apparent length is more than the true length, whereas here, the apparent length is less than the true length. And coming to the third stage, it is the stage of advanced arthritis. The flexion, erection, and internal rotation deformity found in stage two are exaggerated because the whole of the joint has been destroyed, the whole of the cartilage has been destroyed, and here the shortening will be more than one centimeter. So the true shortening will be more than one centimeter, and there will be considerable restriction of hip movements and muscle wasting, and there will be gross destruction of heart club cartilage of the head of the femur in the establum. And the, here, the apparent length is less than, than the true length. So in synovitis stage, the apparent length will be more than the true length. Whereas in early arthritis or advanced arthritis, the apparent length will always be less than true length because there is true shortening. And these are the pictures showing the advanced arthritis. See here, the epiphysis are the, it's been collapsed and there is destruction of the cartilage, thus the flattening of the femoral head and the gross reduction of the joint. Advanced arthritis is with, there is total destruction of the joint. Advanced arthritis, advanced arthritis, that is with subluxation or dislocation. So 
there is total destruction of the femoral head along with the establum and the common advanced arthritis with subluxation or dislocation the common thing are the migrating establum frank pathological posterior dislocation of the hip motor and facial hip prostitutio establia are the features in this stage so this is the late sequelae of stage 4 or advanced arthritis and the tunnel bug test is positive in all the above stages so if you see the motor and facial if you see here motor and facial how to describe it there is a facial here and a wide motor so the establum will be wide whereas the femoral head because of destruction looks like a facial so it, it resembles the ceramic motor and facial type of the chinese article like motor and facial type where the head will be small whereas the establum will be very large so this is the advanced arthritis there will be micro subtypes of migrating establum dislocated hip motor and facial hip protrusio that means the head is been protruding to the pelvis medial side i will show you the pictures of this before that what are the investigation you will do to describe or to to investigate the tb the laboratory test includes the basic blood investigation you should think are hemoglobin if there is a tb the hemoglobin will be very low and the inflammatory response that is the lymphocytes will be increased and there will be increased esr so lymphocytosis anemia and increased Yes, sir. These are the blood parameters that will be shown. And you take the MRI; it will be the investigation of choice. Because if you see here, there is increased density, fluid levels. T, the it appears like a white shadow here. So increased density of the fluid levels in the hip joint it indicates infection. So MRI has become the investigation of choice. Blood test you will do are anemia, either increase in the chronic inflammatory cells the lymphocytes are increased here and such and the esr increase would be below 100 and if you see the our modality of investigation would be x ray initially you should ask for x ray first as an orthopedician you should ask for an x ray and if you see the x ray in the early stages the radiograph shows rarefaction of the bones if you see here there is osteoporosis so there is because of osteoporosis you see the rarefactions and in advanced stages there will be reduction in the joint space and depending upon the radiological features dr shanmugasundaram has described seven types of tuberculosis hip in advanced stage of arthritis so in advanced arthritis seven radiological features has been described by shanmugasundaram which are very important as an orthopedician you should know the radiological features of this advanced arthritis So, what are those seven types of Shanmug syndromes? TB hip. One is normal appearance. Here, the hip is almost looks normal, but for some rarefaction because of osteoporosis, osteolysis, there will be some rarefaction in the X-rays. But the hip almost looks. The concrete of the hip is intact. The femoral head looks intact. The sternum looks intact. That is normal appearance. Only thing the density is the bone densities are decreased. That is the type one. and type 2 is traveling or wandering establum here because of the destruction of the joint due to arthritis and due to the muscle spasm the head of the femur comes to lie in the region of the ilium so there will be subluxation of the hip that is called traveling because of the superolateral destruction of the establum rim the head looks subluxated and part of the head may lie in the ilium so that is called that is traveling or wandering establum because of the destruction of the establum the head subluxates and it lies in the region of the ilium that is the second type and third type is dislocated hip in this condition there is pathological dislocation of the hip joint the head is out of the socket totally out whereas traveling and wandering it is subluxated so you see the diagram here type 1 normal hip traveling establum the weight bearing dome of the establum is lost so it is partially been subluxated out of the socket so superolateral side part of the stellum is destroyed the femoral head is been subluxated and it articulates with the ilium that is subluxated femoral head or traveling stellum and the third type is the totally the head is out of the socket and it is dislocated into the posterior surface or into the ilium pelvis and that is called dislocating hip and the fourth is the perthes type 
What is pethys type? Here, the head of the femur looks like pethys. What is the classic feature of pethys? The femoral head is dense, hence there will be collapse. So there will be density, increase in the density of the femoral head. Whereas initially there will be rarefactions. Whereas pethys type of tuberculosis, the head of the femur is dense, like in pethys. That's why it is called as pethioid tuberculosis. So here the head of the femur is dense and there could be collapse. There will be collapse of the femoral head. And you see the diagram here. This is the fourth type, pethys type. The head looks small and there will be increased density rather than decreased density of the bone. And it looks a small femoral head in the establum socket like pethys. That's why it is called as the pethioid tuberculosis. And the fifth variety is atropic. Atropic type means in the, here the head of the femur is small. It is being shrunken and atropic. That is called as the atropic type. And the sixth one is protrusio. Protrusio establum type. Here, there is cross destruction of the joint space and head of the femur threatens to protrude through the establum into the pelvic cavity. And if you see the diagram here, the protrusion type, if you see here the medial wall, the head is been protruding into the lesser pelvic cavity. It is called as a protrusion. The head is protruding into the establum. That is called as a protruding type. And the final is the motor and pezil. I have already talked about this. This is the head of the femur is small like the pezil and the establum cavity is very wide like a motor. So it will be a small pezil inside the motor that is called as the motor and pezil type. And this classification helps to assess the severity of infection of the hip due to the diseases. So all the stages, pertis type, atropic type, protrusion type, motor and pezil type, bordering, Dislocating type, these are all advanced stages of tuberculosis. In pethys type, classically the head of the femur is dense rather than rarefaction or decreased density. The head is grossly dense and there is could be collapse type pethys. That's why it's called as pethyoid tuberculosis. Atropic type, the femoral head is shrunken and it's small. And protrusion type, the femoral head goes inside, the tries to grow inside into the pelvic lesser lesser pelvic cavity because of medial protrusion of the head because of the destruction of the joint space as well as the floor of the establum and the motor and pezil type the head of the femur is small like a pezil and the establer cavity is wide like a motor so these are all the shenmugashundaram's classifications of radiological classifications of the seven pathological hips in the tv which are very important and you should know the names and the diagrams of those seven types and what are the other investigation other than blood, MRI, X-rays? Basic would be blood, X-rays, and MRI. What are the other investigations you will do? Sinovel fluid analysis. You should estimate the amount of protein, lymphocytes, sugars. So the sugars will be done, proteins will be elevated, and the lymphocytes will be elevated in TB hip. And the most important confirmatory test is always biopsy. So biopsy is always the confirmatory test. These are all additional tests which we will aid in the disease diagnosis, but you should be confirming the TB anyways, always by biopsy. You can take the synovial biopsy and send for culture sensitivity, AFB staining, which will show positive for tuberculosis. And nowadays, Mantox test has become routine, but not much of clinical significance. Treatment. How you will treat the tuberculosis hip? What are the various modalities of treatment? So early stages is called as the synovitis stage and early arthritis stage. The patient is put on chemotherapy and traction. Why the traction? How the traction will help? Traction reduces the muscle spasm, prevents or correction the deformity and maintains the joint space. So traction mainly releases the muscle spasm, prevents, corrects the deformity whatever may be the flexion, abduction, and action deformity, it will bring the limb into neutral because it counters the muscle spasm. And chemotherapy, what are the chemotherapy drugs? Anti-tuberculous therapy, AKT4. What are the four primary drugs? INH, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol. All these drugs should be the line of treatment. So ATT drugs along with traction in the early stage of synovitis and early arthritis, they do great response in tuberculosis. If we, favorable clinical response is obtained, hip is gradually being mobilized. Till then, the patient will be mobilized non weight bearing. If the disease is not responding favorably, then synovectomy and orthotomy are carried out in the synovitis stage. So, even though you put a traction chemotherapy for six to eight weeks, but there is no improvement in the correction of the deformity 
or there is no clinical response like there is no relief of pain or there is ESR doesn't drop down or uh, the patient still complains of symptoms, pains, then the synovectomy and orthotomy will do a great clinical response. Synovectomy means removal or deprivement of the synovium and joint deprivement. That is, you cure it out all the dead bone pieces in the establishment in the femoral side, you open the joint to the posterior approach. So late stages, late stages, there is cross destruction of the joint and the end result of this stage is fibrous ankylosis and the patient is put on chemotherapy and traction initially. Once gross ankylosis is accepted and the limb is in proper position, that is 10 to 30 degrees of flexion, 5 to 10 degrees of external rotation and neutral between the adduction and the abduction, the patient is immobilized in plaster of Paris for Paris spica for six to nine months, and later the patient is made to bear pain. If the limb is not in functional position, then corrective osteotomy and orthrodesis in proper positions are carried out. So this is the treatment modality. So initially traction, chemotherapy. If the patient is doing well, plaster spica immobilization for six to nine months, and then later the patient is made to mobilize. If the limb is not in functional position, it is in abnormal attitude, then corrective osteotomy and orthrodesis are the treatment modalities in advanced arthritis. So what are the surgical treatment in tuberculous hip? Synovectomy and orthrotomy. What is synovectomy? Deprivement of the synovium. Orthrotomy, opening the joint. Surgical opening of the joint. And what, what you will do in this? You will remove the dead panis, synovectomy, dead tissue synovium and the dead bone pieces like you cure it out all the dead lying sequestrum bone pieces from the establishment and the femoral side so that vascularity will improve and the blood will come the inflammatory response will be happening and it will take a dominant upper hand over the tuberculosis so initial stages the surgical treatment would be synovectomy and orthotomy it is done in synovitis stage when the disease is not responding favorably to conservative treatment. The conservative treatment would be traction and ATT. But partial synovectomy and drainage are, and lavage are done in the early stages. It is preferred in the early arthritis, synovectomy and joint debridement. The joint is exposed to the posterior approach and thorough debridement of the joint is done by evacuation and the walls are curated and washed out. Osteotomy, it is done in advanced. So upper corrective femoral osteotomy is indicated in sound ankylosis in bad position, flexion, adduction. So if the limb is in abnormal attitude of flexion, adduction, or external rotation, abduction, then you have to do a correct osteotomy of the femoral side. It helps to correct the deformity and makes the limb strike. So displacement osteotomy is done in fibrous ankylosis with the cross unsound deformity. Arthrodesis. Arthrodesis means fusion of the joint. This is indicated if the hip is very painful and the limb is in abnormal attitude like flexion, abduction, external rotation or flexion, adduction, internal rotation. The patient cannot walk like that. The patient cannot walk like that. So in this, you, in this procedure, you have to convert a painful hip to painless stable hip. The procedure could either be intra-articular, extra-articular, or both. This is indicated in adults with painful fibrous ankylosis with active or heel disease. This procedure converts a painful hip to painless, stable hip. The procedures can be intra-articular. is fused there won't be any pain because of fibrous ankylosis so this is another modality of treatment in advanced arthritis either osteotomy or arthrodesis whereas synovitis and early arthritis the treatment of choice would be synovectomy and joint deprivement arthroplasty is there any role that is replacement of the joint is there any role stiff hip 
is a gross disability and is particularly not acceptable by Indian patient because they cannot use the Indian toilet. Girdlestone excision arthroplasty is being preferred and it can be done in active or heel disease. That means you exercise all the femoral head that gives a painless hip joint, but however, the hip will be very unstable. So the mostly total hip replacement has become the treatment of choice nowadays, but before they used to rarely done, but if you are trying to say do it, but nowadays they are suggesting previously 10 years, you have to wait for the disease active infection to subside and you can replace the femoral head and the stablum, but there is nothing like that nowadays for six to eight weeks, you can put on ATT, take the, if the blood parameters are coming down and the X-rays or the MRI shows inactive disease or the disease activity is less, and the blood parameters are coming down, you can straight away go within total hip replacement and put on ATT cover for six to nine months. So this has been tried, but amniotic arthroplasty has been tried in tuberculosis, never the results are far from satisfactory, but these are all orthodox methods, but totally final head tip replacement. That means once the femoral head and the gestalt has been destroyed, you can straight away deprive the femoral head stablum, put a stem, put a stablum socket, femoral head, and the patient will have stable hip and he will be mobile. This is the latest treatment of modality in the TB hip. So thank you. And this is regarding the TB hip. I have discussed regarding the pathogenesis, the various sites of TB hip, the clinical features, the physical examinations, various deformities, and the various investigation, how you diagnose and the treatment Finally, the treatment would be early synovitis or early arthritis. You have to do joint deprivement or synovectomy. Whereas if it's a late stage, late arthritis, you can do corrective osteotomy to bring the limb into normal functional position. Or if it's the painful hip, you have to do painful fibrous ankylosis. You have to do another modality of treatment that would be orthodesis. That is fusion of the joint in functional position. But many young patients may not like joint to be fused in functional position because the patient will have painless hip, but there won't be any mobility. So instead of arthrodesis, nowadays the latest modality of treatment would be total hip replacement. You can do it once the disease is inactive, after six to eight weeks of ATT. And you check, recheck the blood parameters, everything. Once the disease is inactive, then you do total hip replacement and put him under the anti-tuberculous therapy for six to nine months. And the patient will have functional mobility as well as stable hip. So this is regarding the TB hip. Thank you.